This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Vijay Govindarajan, who is a professor at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Uh, I guess they still call it Dartmouth. They still call it Dartmouth College, or is it? It's, <laughs> it's not Dartmouth University, but it is a university. Um, and uh, he also teaches a little bit at, at Harvard um, and works with lots and lots of companies and is the author of a bunch of books. I only have three of them here, um, most recent of which is called uh, The Three Box Solution, A Strategy for Leading Innovation. And then there's a subtitle, Create the Future, Forget the Past and Manage the Present. Those are the three boxes we'll jump into. Um, but also as co-author of a couple other books, this one is called um, The Other Side of, of Innovation with, with Chris Trimble. Solving the Execution Challenge. And of course, this one, which really is what brought you to my attention, this one is called uh, Reverse Innovation. Um, create Far From Home, Win Everywhere, also co-authored with Chris Trimble. Welcome, VJ. Thank you very much, Greg. So when I read this book, uh, The Three Box Solution, I was really intrigued because it, it put into um, words something that I think a, a lot of people have uh, been thinking you know, we've all been talking about the explore versus exploit challenge that most kind of legacy companies, I call them legacy, but you know, companies that have been around for a while, mature companies, uh, are, are faced with. Um, and you know, you, you add sort of a secret third ingredient, um, which is, I think in many ways, the, the, the reason why companies have trouble juggling those other two is that they haven't really brought to the fore or explicitly tried to tackle this, this other, uh, box, which, which has to do with getting rid of the things that stand in the way, right. You know, whether it's divesting or forgetting, right. Or as I think, you know, Yoda, the original management consultant said, um, you know, you must unlearn if, if you're going to learn, um, why do you suppose it is that, that, um, you know, this third secret ingredient, this, this box, which you talk about this box two. You know, why do you suppose this is something which has not been um, incorporated explicitly into the innovation toolbox of, of so many companies? Uh, Greg, you, you put your finger on the key issue. Uh, just to back up for a moment, just for the purpose of all the listeners, I always ask companies to put whatever they do into three boxes. How many of their activities are in box one? And box one is about manage the present, which is about improve the efficiency of your current business model. Box two is about selectively forget the past. And box three is about create the future. Manage the present, box one. Selectively abandon the past, box two. And create the future, box three. And working with organizations, what I found is they may over focus on box one. Mm -hmm. When box one is terribly important, strategy has to include all the three boxes. And the challenge for companies in box three is how are you going to create your future in the year 2030? And if you want to create your future in the year 2030, then you have a job to do in box two. Namely, you have to selectively forget. And I find of my three boxes, box two is the most challenging. Mm -hmm. And it is one that has not been recognized by academics and practitioners to the extent they should. And I should rightly say, Greg, if you can't forget, you can't learn. As simple as that. And think about how many books we have written about learning organizations. Mm -hmm. We haven't written a single book on forgetting organizations. And the reason why Box 2 is such a big problem is Box two is your current strength. Therein lies your future weakness. Mm -hmm. That is why it is very, very difficult to forget because when you forget, you're forgetting your current strength. Take, for instance, today, General Motors, which 99% of the automobiles that they sell are gasoline-powered, internal combustion-driven automobiles. The future, box three, is in three technologies or intersection of three technologies. Uh, electricity, which is electric mm. vehicles, 
mobile phones, which is rate sharing, and artificial intelligence, which is self-driving cars. Now, that is the future. The reason why General Motors struggles is what they need to forget or forget that you need only mechanical engineers, forget that you need dealership, forget that you will get, make revenues, mm -hmm. service revenues, uh, by putting oil uh, changes and mufflers and gas lines, etc. Those are the things you have to forget if you want to create that future. Yet, what you need to forget is your current strength because there is still needed for 99% of your business, which is not going to go away tomorrow. So therefore, as long as box one has, is also going to be relevant in the future, mm -hmm. the box two problem is how do you forget the rules by which you play in box one? If you cannot forget that, you can never create the future because there is no way on earth that gasoline-powered internal combustion-driven organization can create a self-driving car. Not because they have bad people. If they have the right people, right process, right metric, right kind of capabilities, it is meant for improving efficiency in box one. That is what it is constructed for. The performance engine, box one is constructed for that. You don't want the box one performance engine to forget those. If they forgot those, they don't make money in box one. Yet they stand in the way of creating the future. Therefore, my whole work is around execution. How do you execute box three? If you want to execute box three, you must master the art of box three. That is how I frame it. Yeah, and I think you you talk about the dominant logic, right? You so you say, I think you make the claim that um it's not simply about kind of moving from one product to, to another, right? So if you think about like the classic BCG uh, matrix, right? So, you know, a, a skeptical reader of this might think, well, hey, isn't this just kind of BCG all over again? You know, you got your cash cow, you got, you got to milk that. And you make it very clear that you have to eat while you dream, right? So, you know, you can never forget that kind of box one logic, but that you know, it's not simply about phasing out or reducing your investment in one thing and ramping up your investment in another, but there's this idea of this dominant logic where kind of the business model, the technology, the routines, the psychology, the hiring, you know, all of that stuff is, is in alignment. And that's why, you know, box one works so well if it does, but if you, you know, if you want to kind of go into box three, um, you, you can't just sort of you know, add on an, an additional layer, but you have to kind of engage in some, some, some purging, I, I suppose. And, and, um, you know, this, this, this reminds me when we think about creative destruction, um, you know, when, uh, Schumpeter talked about creative destruction, I think he was really talking about, you know, new companies arising and kind of, you know, putting old companies out of business. But I think what you're doing is you're, you're trying to, you know, take this creative destruction and, and, and pack it into, uh, a, a single, a single firm. And, you know, I, I like how you, you talk about, uh, Vishnu, Shiva and, and Brahma. <laughs> I was wondering if you could kind of recount that. Like, did, did, did that kind of triad of, 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 of gods inspire this, this three box model, or did you kind of only later discover that, uh, kind of metaphor later? In fact, that directly led to this, uh, Three box solution. Uh, I am a very spiritual person. Um, Hindu spirituality talks about these three gods. And as you rightly said, there is Lord Vishnu, he is the god of preservation, that is, box one, manage the present. And then there is Lord Shiva, he is the god of destruction, that is, box two, destroy the past. And then there is Lord Brahma, he is Lord of creation, that is, box three, create the future. And the interesting thing about Hindu spirituality is these three gods have to do their jobs in a balanced way mm -hmm. for humanity as we know to sustain. Therefore, it is not one is more important than the other. It is a question of balance. And Hinduism always believes in circle of life. When you draw life as a circle, the beauty is there is no beginning. There is no end to a circle. Everything that is born in this universe will be preserved. That is the job of Vishnu. That is Boltzmann, manage the person. 
Everything that is preserved will be ultimately destroyed. That is the job of Shiva, that is box two, destroy the past. And everything that is destroyed will get regenerated. That is the job of Lord Brahma, that is box three, create the future. And everything that gets regenerated will be preserved. So this notion of preservation, destruction, and regeneration as a rhythmic continuous cycle is how humanity has sustained. I have simply taken something that is written in the Hindu spirituality 3,000 years ago and package it and present it to companies and say, if General Motors, you want to remain in business forever, you must also master these three processes. Therefore, it is not creating destruction. It is about how can we build institutions forever, which means I have to master these three processes. If we don't, then somebody from outside will destroy you. But is it possible for, I am a very firm believer in large companies because large companies have capabilities. They have assets, they have branding. And if they go under, it is a huge, huge loss for humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, not just for lo jo loss of jobs, loss of capabilities, etc. Therefore, how do we preserve these large institutions? Who can, if they can somehow leverage their assets, and still have this Silicon Valley kind of mindset. Therefore, they can actually incubate and create. Therefore, I want General Motors to be able to create the future while managing the present. And that means they have to preserve and overcome the dominant logic. Mm -hmm. Because the dominant logic is what you need for box one. But the dominant logic will never get you to box three. That is the box two challenge. Therefore, how do you preserve and overcome the dominant logic you do that by creating a dedicated team. And the dedicated team is not a spin-off. Like Clay Christensen uh, talked about, dedicated team is inside the organization. Therefore, it is connected to the mothership. Uh, that is how you can get the mothership advantage. So this notion of distinct but linked organization is a way by which you can overcome the dominant logic, but also benefit from the dominant logic. So that's the easy to say, difficult to do. So that's what I have been working with companies for nearly 40 years, helping companies to execute the three box solution. Three box solution is a simple idea. The simplicity is its power. In fact, I say, if executives take five hours to understand what you're saying, they will never use it. They are going to understand it in five seconds. When I present the three boxes within a minute, Everybody's talking, is it a box one or a box three? And the interesting thing, Greg, I created the three box solution in 1980, literally at the back of an envelope. Uh, and since then, I've been using it with companies. They improvise and develop the theory inside the three box solution. Uh, I have my own ideas, but they are able to say, develop ideas. And really, that's the beauty of the frame. Simple to say, but not simple to do. Simple, but not simplistic. Simple and powerful. That's the way I look at it. Well, well now 40 years later that it's made it into a book, a 200-page book, not, not a <laughs> five-second five summary. <laughs> um, you know, you have quite a few case studies. And, and this dedicated team idea uh, you articulated in, in the other side of, of, of innovation. And, and so I think part of that implies that um, it's very difficult for individuals to kind of... Um, juggle these three things. And, and so, you know, you have to have something of a division of, of labor within the organization. I mean, if, if you as an organization, as, as a leader kind of set up there and announce, Hey, guess what? You know, we're going to disrupt the dominant logic. We're going to destroy the dominant logic. Um, you know, then that means you're not going to be shipping F-150 trucks. And that means you're going to run out of cash, right? Pretty quickly. So, so how do you, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about, um, in fact, you in the book talk about, uh, you know, protecting uh, a certain class of, of, of ideas. And, and I think you're generally talking about the box three, right? How box three needs to be protected and sheltered from the dominant logic. But, but do you also have to kind of protect the, the dominant logic? I mean, if, if some, you know, maverick CEO comes in, I mean, when Satya Nadella came in, we, we talk about how powerful he was as a transformative individual. But did, did he at some level have to also protect the, the, the folks who were 
kind of, you know, bringing in the, uh, the cash flow. Do, do those people need to be protected nowadays? Have we, have we moved to the, in the other direction or, or, or is it, is it, you know, always going to be the case that the dominant logic, they don't need protection. They're like the bullies on the, in, in the schoolyard. Um, they'll, they'll be able to fend for themselves. I would go even one step further and strongly state that they not only need to be protected by the CEO, the dedicated team must show respect for the dominant logic. In fact, it is a very bad idea to antagonize the dominant logic. If you antagonize the dominant logic, they can crush you because the present is the larger entity. Today, 99% of General Motors is dominant logic. They are more in number, they have resources, they bring profits today. If you antagonize them, they will squash you. Quite the contrary, dominant logic is not your enemy. Mm -hmm. Dominant logic is your friend. Because without dominant logic, there is no future. Without the profits that are coming from cash flow that is coming from dominant logic, you can't invest if you have General Motors in self-driving cars. Even more importantly, dominant logic can also not just give you cash, but give you capabilities. Because self-driving car is still a car. That means somebody's got to teach you how to make the hardware. That is what General Motors knows. So the marriage between dedicated team and the dominant logic is how you create the box key. In fact, people make a mistake that box three innovation team is the dedicated team. I say no. Box three innovation team is not the dedicated team. Box three innovation team is dedicated team in partnership with what I call shared staff. Mm -hmm. And the shared staff are inside the performance engine. Shared staff are supporting the box three. So when you think of it that way, if you're a leader of the dedicated team, why would you want to antagonize? The performance engine, that is your friend. The shared staff inside the performance engine are the ones who are helping you. Without that, you will go nowhere because then there is no difference between the dedicated team and a pure Silicon Valley startup. Mm -hmm. That is why I don't like spin-offs. Spin-offs imply they are competing just like any other Silicon Valley startup. Then what is their advantage? Nothing. Whereas now you are giving an advantage, but of course, that borrowing relationship will be fraught with conflicts and conflicts are good, conflicts are healthy, conflicts need to be managed. So that's the, that's how I, I, I have three rules for execution. These are simple rules, but not simple to say, not simple to do. If you follow these three rules, then you can de-risk box three. Rule number one, create a dedicated team. And the dedicated team should be built with principles different from the performance engine. Not because you are doing a favor for dedicated team, because it is a new business model. Self-driving car is a new business model. And so presumably you have different metrics of success then for those, those teams, right? So milestones exactly. instead of, you know, exactly. income or cash flow or something like that. Absolutely. Different metrics, different processes you can have, different capabilities, different people. That's rule number one. Rule number two, the dedicated team should not be isolated from the mothership. Connect the dedicated team to the mothership and try to forge a partnership. That means you have to have strategies to reduce conflicts. That's rule number two. Rule number three is treat the box three project as a set of hypotheses. Mm -hmm. That's all box three is. It's based on weak signals because future cannot be predicted. Future can be only imagined based on weak signals. Therefore, it is a set of hypotheses. Then try to test hypotheses one at a time, testing the most critical hypotheses first. And as you test the hypotheses, you gain more confidence in the box tree. Then you can invest even more resources in box tree. Three simple rules, simple to say, not simple to do. So, but how, how does the CEO message this, right? So it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, you're retreating from a hostile uh, a combat zone and, and you're telling a bunch of people, okay, you guys, you, you, you're going to, we're going we're to leave you guys behind and, and, and you guys just, you know, defend the perimeter and we're all going to, you know, jump on the, on, on the helicopters and, and take off and, and leave you here to be, you know, slaughtered. Right. I mean, isn't that kind of the message with, that you're giving to the, to the box one folks? Like, 
you know, we really appreciate everything you're doing for us, but all the cool kids are over here, you know, uh, dealing with the future. And, and as soon as, you know, you stop generating the cash, then we're all, we're just going to cut you loose and send you off onto the ice flow and, and be done with you. Right. I mean, how do you, how do you message simultaneously that, that, you know, you're taking both uh, initiatives seriously, the, 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 the box one and the box three. That's a great question, Greg. I think that is the art of the leader. The CEO should never say box one is a dinosaur, box three is the future. I think the CEO has to message creating the future requires us. A role for both performance gap, which is what box one is, and possibility gap, which is what box three is. Neither one is without focus on goal, we are never going to achieve our futures. By the way, there are only very, very few cases where there has been a complete destruction of box one. It has happened. If you think of photography, the analog photography just disappeared. If you think of typewriters, they disappeared with the word processing. Those are rare. In fact, in most industries, Box one never disappears. Box one actually transforms and survives and prospers. You think of even newspapers, New York Times. Newspaper is not dead today, even though New York Times Digital started almost 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, people thought New York Times uh, internet media will kill the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Quite the contrary, actually, the newspaper subscription went up because suddenly the New York Times Digital, somebody is reading it in Kansas City, then they say, I should probably subscribe to the newspapers, mm -hmm. put it on good content. So it is very important. And think, similarly, think about big copiers haven't disappeared when the small copiers came. Mainframe computers haven't disappeared. Therefore, it is a question of transformation. So therefore, the way the CEO has to sell is create a strategic intent for the year 2030, a world where, if you say automobile company, auto mobility will be the future. In that auto mobility future, I see a role for box one and box three. And therefore, that is how I'm going to drive the investment. Certain box one activities will have to get closed down, but the CEO has to convince the organization that cost, there is cost of cannibalization. That is what they are worried about. Mm -hmm. You start box three, they're cannibalizing box four. But there is a cost of inaction. And it is this, as a CEO, I have a point of view as to how we need to balance the cost of cannibalization with the cost of inaction. And it is not easy, but that is why CEOs with vision who can share their point of view in a convincing way, will be able to actually insight, uh, excite and motivate both sides of the equation. But some of them will have to, will be losing their job. That's, that is, that is part of the progress, right? Uh, otherwise, in a way, you know, where do you want a cell phone? Uh, they, we would rather live in the world, uh, old world. But every time you have a technological progress, something has to give, uh, but that is inevitable nature of how progress happens. But I think as a CEO, never, never minimize the importance of box one. It is very rare case where there is complete disruption. I am talking about most industries transform. They don't disrupt. Uh, therefore, disruption is where you, you are more afraid. Mm -hmm. But those are very few cases. But sometimes companies will kind of. Um, uh, divest themselves, right, of kind of old divisions and old businesses, product lines, that sort of thing, and and realize that maybe they would have more value in other people's hands, right? That if the if the culture of the company has kind of shifted, exactly. So therefore, then you are basically saying you are not part of my future. That doesn't mean you don't have a future. Maybe you 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 are better off in someone else's hand. It is all a question of. Actions by the CEO will be, when people may be disappointed, but they can see the logic if you present it with a point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think, um, 
you know, when you talk about these, these, these traps, right, you talk about the complacency trap, the cannibalization trap and, and the, the competence trap, um, you know, these are some of the obstacles to, uh, what's sometimes referred to as, uh, ambidexterity, right? Um, and these, a lot of these are, are cultural, right? A lot of these have to do with, with a mindset, right? So some of them obviously are about incentives. Some of them obviously about systems and, and processes, but, but a lot of it's also kind of about the, you know, the psychology of the organization, right? The habits, the, the, the ways of, of thinking, the, the ways of, of interacting with other people in, in the organization. So if, if you're trying to kind of get, a uh, a box three initiative going, uh, what is the, the hardest part is the hardest part kind of, you know, creating this separate organization, right. With the, the separate teams, or is it really all about, you know, finding people to, to put into these teams, or is it about, you know, changing the mindset of the people who you're putting into these teams? What's the, what's the biggest hurdle? Cause everyone talks about ambidexterity. Everybody talks about the need to, you know, innovate and, and yet, now, so many companies run, run into problems with it. I think in my experience in this field, what I find is there is idea and then there is execution. People overspent on ideation and coming up with bigger and better box the ideas. My all focus has been on execution. And Thomas Alva Edison put it very well when he said, innovation is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. And he ought to know because he was the greatest innovator of all time. And the 99% perspiration is the execution. By the way, the value of an idea is zero at the time you come up with the idea. Mm -hmm. It's just an idea. That's all. There's no value. Value comes only when you execute it. Therefore, I say the biggest, biggest problem in companies is not lack of ideas. It is lack of capacity to execute the ideas. Therefore, the biggest challenge is in the execution. That includes changing mindsets, changing structures, changing capabilities, changing processes, changing people. All of them are hard. Mm -hmm. And mindsets you can change by changing people. Because you can't change mindset directly. You change mindset by changing people. And it is hard. It takes time. Therefore, I would say building the dedicated team correctly, linking it with the mothership, and then testing hypotheses. All of them are pregnant with challenges. Therefore, I won't just put my finger and say, this is the only thing that's a challenge. This whole execution is a challenge. My focus is how do you actually create an ambidextrous organization by really focusing on these three rules. Mm -hmm. And much of my research and writing and working with companies is showing them the robustness and richness of these three rules, where they are so easy uh, to understand, but not easy to do. So there are challenges in all the three rules. Well, one of the analogies you use is this idea of uh, fitness, right? And, and you talk about how, you know, if, if you, if you go to the gym on a regular basis, then, you know, you're, you're kind of prepared when you have to, uh, you know, do something like, you know, lift a heavy object or, you know, run or whatever. And, and, um, and you sometimes refer to this as kind of planned opportunism, right? So opportunities are able to be exploited for those that are prepared for them when they, when they arrive. Um, and so, you know, how would you put this metaphor into practice, this idea of, you know, organizational fitness, right? Or, you know, thinking about having a, a you know, is the CEO kind of the personal trainer that's, that's um, you know, getting people in, in shape so that they are prepared for this? How, how does that metaphor actually work its way into execution? Planned opportunism is a construct, Greg. I find this foundational for innovation. And it is also foundational in the way I run my own life. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you an example from my life, and then I will tell you how it applies to organizations. You see, planned opportunism essentially says is think fundamental changes in one's life. You can break, look at your own life and say, what big pivots happened in your life? I can look at my life. What big changes happened in my life? 
is always because of chance events. Chance, random events make a huge change in our life. That is the opportunism part. How you respond to a chance event is anything but chance. That is the plan part. Plan is about understanding your ambition, understanding your dream, building the right capabilities. The more you are sure of yourself, your capabilities, your vision, your dreams, your fears, your limitations, your strengths, you will take, you will be confident to take a, a risk on the right chance event. Mm -hmm. Basically, life is never a planned event. Life is never a random event either. It is this interplay between random events and intentional choices. Is how life sh shapes. I use the same metaphor for companies. Strategy is never a random event. Strategy is never planned. So it is this interplay between planning and opportunism is what creates the future. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a very simple example. I grew up in, a, in India and I'm an accountant. And for my accounting exam, there were required texts and then there were reference texts. Reference texts, by definition, are not required for the exam. But I used to have a habit of reading those reference texts just to see what I can learn from. I must have read a lot of reference texts. None of them made any impact except one. This is an iconic professor at Harvard Business School called Bob Anthony. Mm -hmm. His book on accounting, when I read it, the first sentence said, accounting is not a technical subject. I said, wow. I thought accounting is boring. This guy is saying accounting has nothing to do with debits and credits. He says accounting influences human behavior. Mm -hmm. I remember that day, I said, you know, I must come to Harvard Business School. <laughs> and studying underneath professors like this who think so differently. That changed my life. Mm -hmm. So that was a pure accident. Nothing but an accident. But it is also planned in the sense I had ambition, I had desires, I had capabilities. Mm -hmm. It is that marriage. By the way, the accidents also indirectly you can influence, you can never control it, indirectly influence. Because the re reason I ran into Bob Anthony's book was I have a habit of reading reference books. <laughs> so it is this interplay is what determines our individual life. Therefore, it also determines a corporate life in terms of strategy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what does this mean practically? What it means is if you have a CEO focused on the preparation part. The preparation part is identify weak signals, develop hypotheses, develop capabilities, understand your strategic intent. That's all you can 100% control. But then there will be a lot of random events. But many times the preparation itself be bringing some random events into your sphere of. So therefore, that is what I, therefore, is creating the future is never a random process. Right. Never a hard process. It is that interesting. And you use the metaphor of the two horses, which I think you, you took from Elizabeth Gilbert in, in her novel. I was actually at a conference where uh we were both um speakers and and i remember she gave a wonderful talk and and uh and and the the, the metaphor of the two horses you, know, you say you know focus on the horse you can control and, and and not the one you can't control right in in fact uh, greg this planned opportunism relates to the two horse metaphor by the way it's kind of interesting my grandfather who was just about everything for me he taught me the two horse metaphor when he was young. He, this is the one yeah. whose picture is at the front of the, uh, of the book. Exactly. Yeah. Whose picture is in the uh, front of the book, because he's the one who really helped me to understand the true meaning of strategy. By that I mean, you know, I used to stand first in class in schools. Uh, that was never a problem because only 10 kids, I, I know the other night, I don't know how to beat them. Then I came to the university. My university had 25,000 students, and I didn't know any of them. I stood first in the university, won the gold medal, took the gold medal and my transcript to my grandfather. They kind of looked at it and said, hmm, 
you only got 95 out of 100 in history. There is an honor of the possible here. Five more marks we should get. You only got 90 out of 100 in English. There is another out of the possible. Mm. He wasn't trying to intimidate me. He wasn't trying to humiliate me. He wasn't trying to embarrass me. What he was telling me was, VG, never be satisfied in being a gold medalist amongst 25,000 students. That should never be your bar. Your bar should be your true potential. Therefore, what he taught me was strategy is about achieving true potential. That's what I ask companies. When I work with companies, I say, are you achieving your true potential today? If you have not, then you are not seizing the power of strategy. Achieving true potential is having balance of course in three boxes. If you want to achieve your true potential in the year 2030, you got to invest in all the three boxes. What my grandfather was telling me was make competition irrelevant. The only competition that matters is self-competition. And self-competition is about achieving true potential. You see, you achieve, he used to tell me, read you 100 out of 100. That's what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. You're going to win gold medal amongst 25,000 students. That goes without saying. <laughs> Go for your true potential. And I have internalized that. And, and, and in some sense, you know, there was a great swimmer, KT Ledecky. I'm looking forward to her next month. She's a freestyle swimmer. She, she, she doesn't do short races. She only does long races. At the tender age of 15, Katie Ledecky won gold in 800 meter freestyle in 2012 London Olympics. Incredible accomplishment because at the age of 15, you, you, your body is not even strong enough to swim 800 meters, much less win gold medals in 800 meters. 2016 Rio Olympics, she won five medals, four gold and one silver. At the age of 90, the most celebrated female swimmer ever. She is the Michael Phelps equivalent on the female side. Unlike Michael Phelps, she is a very, very nice person. Right after 2016 Rio Olympics, PBS News Hour had an interview. And the PBS News Hour interviewer asked her, what is the secret sauce behind your success? And she said something similar to what my grandfather was telling me. She said, I never race against other swimmers. I only race against time. So in 2016 Rio Olympics, she came in and asked her coach, what is humanly possible to do in 800 meter freestyle? And the coach said, it is not humanly possible to complete 800 meters in anything less than eight minutes and five seconds. That is the theoretical limit. She said, I'm going to beat that. I believe she came eight minutes and four seconds. Silver medalist did eight minutes and 28 seconds. Silver medalist did eight minutes, 28 seconds. Ledecky did eight minutes, four seconds. And the 24 second difference was more than two pool length difference in 800 meters. If she did eight minutes and 27 seconds, she would have won gold. But if you want to achieve your true potential, then you have to think big, think bold. And, and, and so I have been very much influenced by that in my own career. And that's what I tell companies. Three box solution is nothing more than achieving your true potential. And achieving your true potential is not about what you do in the year 2030. It's about how you allocate resources. What my grandfather was telling me is you are obsessed with performance gap. You also have a possibility gap. Mm -hmm. Why don't you obsess with that? Well, it, like, like you, I sometimes tell my students that the principles that we apply to corporate strategy can be applied to their own uh, careers and their own lives, right? A lot of insights there. But, you know, when you're talking about these three boxes, you, you, t you say also that it's sometimes very difficult for people within the organization to themselves uh, balance those three. And so they kind of have to specialize at least most of the time in, in kind of, you know, at least box one or box two. I mean, box one or box three, we'll, we'll, we'll talk later about whether it's possible to specialize in box two, but, um, as an individual, um, if you can't, if it's hard to do that within a company, how do you do it as an individual? Right. So if I, if I'm, you know, walking through my daily life and thinking about my goals and aspirations, um, you know, I, I need to also eat while I dream. So, so how do I, uh, kind of shift gears? Um, do, do I need to say, okay, from nine to five, I'm going to 
you know, focus on this. And then after five, I'm going to, you know, focus on my dream and aspiration or, you know, how do you, how do you kind of prepare for the next thing while also trying to, you know, be the best you can be in, in the current thing? I very firmly believe three box solution can and should be applied at the individual level. And what that means is I must have a moonshot statement for the year 2030, mm -hmm. just like John F. Kennedy had. And then I need to think about, am I investing enough resources and time and energy in box one, box two, box three on an ongoing basis towards that moonshot? Now, you ask the question, how do I do this practically? Uh, in fact, most individuals find it very hard. If I ask someone, hey, what's your moonshot? In the year 2030, they may say, hey, wait a minute, I don't even know where I'm going to be. Uh, you're asking me to give a moonshot statement for 2030. Yes, it is hard, but it is, I am just asking you to come up with a point of view. I'm not asking you to mm -hmm. come up with a very definite statement, sort of detailed statement. It is your ambition. It is your purpose. It's your intent. That doesn't mean every day I need to allocate equal amount of time in all the three boxes, but it is very important for me at least once a month, reflect and say, have I found enough time to invest in all the three boxes? I think that discipline is very, very important. I too tell my students, my MBA students, you put box one on hold when you came for the MBA program, yeah. isn't it? Because the two years, you are just investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. After the MBA program is over, it is not just I go back to box one 100% because the world keeps changing. Half-life of knowledge keeps declining. Uh, your interest and motivations and, and opportunity set will continue to evolve. Therefore, it is a continuous process. And, and don't tell me it is not possible to do because it requires deep reflection. I say, you came to learn about accounting, finance, this, that, and the other, fine. But also get in touch with yourself. Mm -hmm. Take the time. Box two requires deep reflection to figure out what are the things which are even my current strengths that I must give up in order to reach where I need to go. And I ask them, go oh, meet interesting people. They will help you with this. Meet Dalai Lama. He'll change you. Change your way of thinking. Read interesting books. Nothing connected with business. You take a look at Nelson Mandela's Long Road to Freedom. You understand three box solution. That's what he did. Great leaders, when they write their autobiographies, Nelson Mandela was a soldier when he was a young man. He carried arms against white people. On that, he was put in prison. Not for 27 hours, not for 27 days, not for 27 weeks, not for 27 months, for 27 years. He was an angry young man having feelings of hatred, anger, violence. Imagine 27 years, they put you in prison and torture you. Those feelings will only solidify. Instead, he had deep reflection and said, if South Africa has to transform, I have to transform. If I have to transform, I must give up this feeling of violence, anger, and take on more non-violence, peaceful reconciliation, etc. He even invited the very same white gods who tortured him in the prison. He invited him to the inauguration. What I'm saying is, it is not possible for you to Think about organizational transformation if you're not willing to do personal transformation. And that requires three box thinking. So I very much, very firmly believe you must apply it at the individual level. If you are in an accounting function, you can think about three boxes. If you're in human resources function, think about three boxes. It is not just for corporate. As a human resource function, what are our box two challenge, box one challenges? What are the talent we need to recruit? For today's business, how do we recruit talent for 2030? You can have programs for all the things. You can apply to it too. How do I change to become relevant? And I find that successful people find it very difficult to practice three box solution because successful people mistake 
current success for validation of the past. Mm -hmm. So therefore, their way of creating the future is to repeat the past. As my good friend Marshall Goldsmith has a book, What Got You Here, Won't Get You There. Right. And, and therefore, it, it, it is a three box solution at an individual level is as relevant as for a division or a function or a corporation. Yeah, I want to dig into this box too, because this really is a differentiator. And, um, you know, th this idea of forgetting or willful forgetting or, or kind of perfecting your, your, your forgetting. I actually first encountered this idea probably 30 years ago in, in Nietzsche. He wrote an essay on the uses of uh, abuses of, of history. And, and, you know, I was a, I was a historian at the time and, and I, you know, I thought history is all about kind of, you know, remembering the, the past, but you know, progress often requires us to, to forget the past and, and move on from the past. And so at, at an organizational level, like, how do you do this? I mean, you know, you can't appoint sort of a chief forgetting officer, right? Or, or a chief, you know, um, orthodoxy, uh, destruction mm -hmm. officer right? or, or, you know, chief Shiva officer, right? Like, how do you, how do you do this? Um, you know, Education is one way, right? Periodic educational. We, we, I often run these, um, workshops kind of, sometimes they're called design thinking workshops where, um, you know, everyone has to articulate an orthodoxy of their company or an orth orthodoxy of their business unit. And then, um, you know, put it underneath the, 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 you know, the spotlight and really examine it. Um, are those kinds of interventions kind of, uh, how, how you do it? Do you have kind of. Uh, I don't know, brainstorming sessions, identify some orthodoxies, you know, bring them to the surface, uh, articulate them and examine the, the, the rationale behind them and then figure out which ones you want to reject. I mean, you, you use the, the four monkey story, which I always mm -hmm. love the, the four monkey story. Um, and, and I like in the four monkey story, it's, it's about really kind of surfacing the, the rationale, which had been forgotten for the different kind of routines and mindsets so that you can decide whether you want to reaffirm them or reject them. Is, is this a, is this something that, you know, is a full-time job for certain people like the, the chief learning officer of the organization, or is this something that, that uh, requires just kind of periodic interventions like offsites or, or how do you, how do you actually put in place, um, a practice of, of continual, uh, selective forgetting? So I would say a combination of both approaches. What do I mean by that? I think box two is specific to the box three project you are embarking. Mm -hmm. Box two is forgetting those things that will prevent you from executing the box three idea. So that is the specific box two challenge. Therefore, you create a dedicated team which can shield you away from the box two orthodoxies that mm -hmm. are helping box one. At the same time, as a chief learning officer, when you're having leadership development programs and you're educating your entire organization, educate them on three box solution. Educate them on why box two is so important. Therefore, when you are creating these dedicated teams with different compensation, different metrics, they know why that is being done. Mm -hmm so that they know it is not that you are treating one group in, as a special, uh, uh, you're doing a special favor to that group. It is because of the power of the dominant logic, which will overwhelm that box three. So education to everybody is a very good idea because everybody then begins to understand why we are having all the three boxes in the organization. Because that kind of large scale education will also educate the box three team. That's the way box one is important. Box one team to understand why they're doing this specific box two. And that kind of education, I, I don't think it is a, we should appoint the chief forgetting officer, but chief learning officer could be a person who champions these kinds of education intervention so that the whole organization has a better understanding, a deeper understanding of the cultural change that we are trying to bring about. So I want to tie this together with the, your book, uh, Reverse Innovation, because, um, you know, this, this is a book which talks about how companies in, in developed, um, companies in developed countries can learn from initiatives in emerging markets or from companies in emerging markets. And, you know, I used to teach multinational management way back when, and, um, kind of the, 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 the kind of underlying 
orthodoxy in, in multinational management was that uh, companies in the developed world would take equity stakes or, you know, create subsidiaries in emerging markets. Uh, and then that would facilitate the transfer of know-how, right, from, from the mother to the daughter firm, so to speak, right, in the language of the old uh, English multinationals. Um, and so this transfer of know-how was almost continuously, you know, going from more technologically advanced to less technologically advanced areas. Um, then I, I remember I, one of the cases that I taught was this Fuji Xerox case, and it's, you know, a classic Harvard case. And, you know, what was fun about that case was that it was the um, parent company that was learning from the kind of child company in, in, in Japan. And, and I think, you know, nowadays we, we see this bilateral flow of, 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 of insight. And I remember I was uh, visiting a, a bank in South Africa and um, they had been required by law to set up an initiative around inclusive banking. And nobody really at the bank wanted to deal with this because they saw this as a low margin business. They saw it as a, as a, as a backwater and, and it was mainly for the kind of, you know, CS, the CSR folks. Uh, but ultimately they, they put together a kind of a, a mobile banking solution for the underserved markets, you know, that didn't have branches. And it was so much technologically more sophisticated than what the, the wealthy customers had that, that the wealthy customers started insisting on it. And then that became kind of the cool place to work. Right. And then everybody wanted to work in that part because that was the place where all the technology was happening. And, and, you know, when, when we see that mobile banking penetration in, in, you know, some developing countries exceeds that of what we see in, in the U S um, it, it makes, it makes you wonder, you know, have we been getting this backwards for, for a long time, right? Have we, um, allowed the orthodoxies of how we do business in these developed countries kind of get in the way of, of innovations that could come from unexpected places? Is that, is that really the, the, the message of the book that, you know, as a learning organization, you know, your learning can come from anywhere. You're absolutely right. To me, reverse innovation is an example of a box tree breakthrough innovation. Because when you're thinking of an emerging economy like India, what happens is in India, only 10% of the consumers are similar to consumers in the West. The 90% of the consumers have different demand characteristics, different income levels, and different kinds of tastes and preferences, etc. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Western goods and services, even with modification, cannot cater, cater to the 90%. Now, historically, multinationals ignored that 90% non-consumers mm -hmm. because there was good organic growth by just staying with global products. That all changed as developed countries begin to slow down, but also it changed because these poor countries really put on, put on bulk in the last two or three decades, because particularly China, probably earlier than India, but they became really huge markets of consumption only in the last two decades. Therefore, why historically multinationals didn't focus on these markets, not only these markets weren't that big, but they were able to grow anyway uh, with, by producing and selling, if you're an American multinational in the U.S., and then selling it in other rich countries and selling it to the rich segment yeah. in poor countries. That all changed in the last two decades. Therefore, reverse innovation as a phenomenon has become more interesting and more relevant and more practical. Uh, that is the way I would put it. And, and if you come to think of it, it's, it's very logical that someone in India, their per capita income is $2,000. The per capita income in the U.S. is $50,000. There is no product that satisfies a middle class in the U.S. where mass market per capita income is $50,000 will satisfy middle class in India where the mass market per capita income is $2,000. You have to think differently. You have to think box clear. So... When I went to India as part of General Electric, we did a box tree in India for one of the medical imaging equipment. Then we said, hey, once we did it, we could actually sell it in all countries, including in the U.S. That's when I and Jeffrey Mel came up with this concept called reverse innovation. And 
it is not that the traditional way of innovating has lost relevance because we will continue to innovate in the U.S. and spread that innovation all over the world. But that's not the only way to do it. We can also think the other way. Uh, Fuji Xerox is a good example. We had isolated examples like that, but now there are many more such examples. That's what I would say. So my last couple of questions have to do with business education, right? So you've been a edu business educator for, for decades and you know, you've seen a lot of different trends come and go. Um, and so, you know, I have two questions. I mean, one has to do with the three box solution and, you know, do we do a good enough job of box two in business education? Cause you mentioned that, you know, when people come to business school, they put box one on the shelf and they focus on box three, but you know, are we doing enough to kind of uh, offer courses and forgetting, like, do we, should we, maybe what we should do when we, uh, have our, on our website, talk about the curriculum and say, these are all things you're going to learn. These are all things you're going to unlearn, right? you know? Uh, and, and then the second question has to do with, um, you know, reverse innovation. We have people from India, from China, from all over the world coming to get MBAs in, in the United States. And, you know, most of the cases that we use are cases that around American companies and, and, and so forth. And, and then they're supposed to take these best practices back to, to their, their, their native lands. And there are some fantastic success stories. And, you know, you talk about Mahindra and, and, you know, what was it, what they were able to achieve, but, you know, shouldn't our, our business school students be thinking about learning more from, uh, emerging markets and other countries. And, you know, we, 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 all, we have at, at, at my business school, we have a kind of sometimes some students go on these week long immersion programs, but that's kind of about it, right? When it comes to exposure to, to markets and, you know, business schools are opening campuses in, in other countries, but they just fly over the, the professors from Cambridge or, you know, from California, and then they fly them back and, and, and they really don't have like a local faculty or, or, you know, a local, um, you know, course development or, or anything like that. I mean, even, you know, Wharton has a campus in San Francisco and it's just, they just fly people, you know, from the developed market all the way out to the emerging market and then, and fly them back. Are, are we missing an opportunity here uh, on the education side to do a better job of, of, you know, arbitraging these insights? Uh, the answer is a strong, yes, I think. I don't know whether we need a course on organizational forgetting as much as exposure to students about deep reflection. And one can even start with their own personal careers as well as their organizational experiences to think about how do you uh, actually identify what you need to forget and go about actually practicing it. So maybe there is more experience-based courses and mm -hmm. there are coaches who can help maybe even appoint a coach for each student or a collection of students and help them with the deep reflection and the role of box tools uh, and way that is important. Coming to emerging markets, again, I can't agree with you anymore that other cases are all uh, based on Western multinationals and Western contexts and the protagonists are all Western executives. I think we need to bring more diversity. By diversity, I mean even women, African-American protagonists, but also emerging markets. And I think there is no other way you can understand the business model in Brazil or Africa or India, but for doing a case study, more than one case study in those markets trying to understand why their context is so important, so different. You can't simply say the same principles apply. Yeah, maybe the same principles apply, but the context is so different. The way the principles apply is very different. So I think doing more case studies, of course, I, I support the global expeditions. It's one way to broaden your perspective, but spending just a week there is not enough. Uh, and also I would, agree with you that faculty mindset has to change because it, it, somehow, it, I, I'll give you a very quick example of what I mean by this. When I came to Tuck, this is the early part of my career, this is a famous marketing professor who's a great teacher, so I went to listen to his class to see what I can learn about his teaching style. And the case study was about 
all can aluminum this is a major aluminum company which got a news from general motors saying that general motors is terminating their agreement to buy aluminum from all can aluminum so it is a major crisis because general motors is a big customer and they said no i don't want to deal with you so the case study is written about aluminum all can aluminum what should they do so for the first 45 minutes uh, this is a white american professor marketing great guy and for first 45 minutes the students were discussing what all the various options for all can aluminum and its ceo to pursue then a japanese student put up his hand and the japanese student said we are asking the wrong question and we are focusing for 45 minutes on the wrong question the real question is what should general motors do general motors let one of its suppliers quality drop to a point that they are terminating that supplier mm -hmm. general motors should have actually think differently about how to keep their suppliers at high quality i thought what an interesting twist to the case this mm is -hmm. i could see this white american his face turned red he couldn't that wasn't part of his teaching plans so he quickly called on another american student who almost ignored what the japanese students said and went back to what alkan alumnum did i thought to myself the reason he didn't do it is this professor doesn't have a global mindset so unless you the professor had a global mindset he would have said wow this is amazing this is so we should just change the whole equation the other way so therefore we need to maybe even train our american faculty and send them off to these emerging markets and go spend six months there or whatever so therefore when they teach even american cases they have a different lens but they will also be more comfortable bringing cases from emerging markets and teaching them because i think there is no substitute for actually dealing with a case set in a different context mm -hmm. that is the best way you could learn i totally agree with that yeah and i think that's a type of fitness uh that can be uh exercised and developed uh for sure um vj it's been fantastic chatting with you um i want to remind everybody to check out this book it's called um the three box solution some fantastic case studies we didn't even talk about uh kurig or uh you know any of the other wonderful case studies in there um also this book here reverse innovation um I check this one out and um this one which we barely even scratched the surface of uh called the other other side of of innovation uh appreciate you joining me vj hope to see you sometime uh in the flesh soon this is on silo brought to you by alumni fm connecting people through stories 